Okay, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I hope everyone's healthy. And I thank Senator Stabenow and Van Hollen for joining us today. Uh, first, I'm going to say a few words about the President's executive order. Uh, while the President has finally acknowledged the need for policing reform, one modest, inadequate executive order will not make up for his decades of inflammatory rhetoric and his recent policies designed to roll back the progress that we've made in previous years. Unfortunately, this executive order will not deliver comprehensive, meaningful change in accountability in our nation's police departments that Americans are demanding. Now is the moment for real, lasting, comprehensive change. We cannot merely make some changes around the margins. And yet, yet today's event was typical of President Trump. He holds the event, spends the bulk of his remarks throwing out raw meat to his base, and out, outright lying about the good work done by the Obama administration. He said President Obama did nothing on police reform, but the fact is they made a lot of progress and President Trump rolled it back. So Congress needs to pass strong, bold legislation that improves transparency, accountability and training into our nation's police departments, and President Trump must commit to signing such a bill into law. Now, on the issue we came forward for here, is which is COVID. We Democrats have called on Leader McConnell to take up the COVID bill this month before July 4th, but there's no indication that the Senate will act. By delaying action, Senate Republicans are playing the same dangerous political games they have played on issue after issue. Take the mass shootings. They talk about it. They say we need to do something. Let's wait. Let's see. This time to the end of July. And then nothing happens because they think the fervor will have died down. But this isn't an issue of fervor. This is an issue of health and economy. And unless we do more, the economy is going to get worse and the COVID virus could come right back up at us. So delay won't work, and we need to act now. And as our Republican friends twiddle their thumbs, our nation moves closer and closer to a number of cliffs that threaten our economy, American workers, and may cause a slower and weaker recovery. Here are some of the cliffs. No new applications for PPP after June 30th. State and local governments need to finalize their budgets by July 1st, and many will be forced to make deep cuts requiring huge amounts of layoffs to critical to, of workers in critical public service because there will be no federal support and they have to balance their budgets. The moratorium on evictions expires on July 24th. The emergency unemployment insurance expires on July 31st. If schools don't get money quickly, they won't be able to open up in September. And then what? What happens to people who have to go to work, but their kids are at home? So today, so there are their cliffs, the cliff of PPP, the cliff of state and local government needs, the cliff on evictions, the cliff on unemployment insurance, the cliff on opening up schools. They're all approaching, and our Republican colleagues are twiddling their thumbs. Today, Leader McConnell and I received a letter signed by over 100 economists, including Chairs Bernanke and Yellen, and many other scholars and Nobel laureates and experts calling on Congress to renew these important programs. Chairman Powell today, hardly a liberal Democrat, reiterated his call for fiscal action. Everyone knows we have to act, except, it seems, the Republican Senate and the President. If we fail to act quickly, it makes the chances that our economy going if we fail to act quickly, it makes the chances our economy will go over the cliff more likely and more dangerous. Senator Stabenow. Well, thank you very much, Senator Schumer. Tomorrow, the Democratic Senate Policy and Communications Committee will once again be releasing a report on the cost of inaction. And this one is a the price of inaction is highest for poor families, poor and low wealth Americans. And that is the reality. 
that millions of people face in our country. Before COVID-19, nearly 40 million Americans were already living in poverty. Imagine what it's like to be a woman of color who's a single mom with two children in school. She works a low-wage job. She makes maybe $10, $12 an hour. She's barely making ends meet. She's one of the more than one quarter of Americans who don't even have $400 in the bank for an emergency, like the refrigerator breaks down or the car needs a new transmission. Then the pandemic hits. She still has to go to work because like many women, many people of color, her job is viewed as essential. And she doesn't have the luxury of working from home like all of us do. She's praying she doesn't get sick from her customers. She doesn't have health insurance, already struggles to afford medical treatment. And most of all, she's worried about her kids. She's afraid she's gonna bring home the virus and get them sick. And then what? She knows she can go to the local community health center where she's taking her children before, but the center is struggling to keep its doors open too under the strain of the pandemic. And now the schools close. Who's taking care of them while she's at work? She's wondering how she'll make rent this month when she's already one of the one in four renters who pay more than half their income on housing. And now her income's dropped. And even if she can keep a roof over her children's head, she's worried about them getting enough healthy food to eat. And now she's among the 29% of black Americans who doesn't have enough food to last the month. And meanwhile, she's wondering what she's supposed to do in terms of her time and technology to make sure her kids don't fall behind in school. This mom and her family and millions of other families are who we are fighting for. That's who the House of Representatives was fighting for when they passed the HEROES Act. This mom deserves a fair wage. She deserves heroes pay. You know, applause is not enough for her to take care of her family. She, she deserves hazard pay as an essential worker. And her family deserves the support provided by the HEROES Act passed by the House so she doesn't hit those cliffs that Senator Schumer was talking about. The bottom line's this. While Republicans continue to work on behalf of the wealthy and the well-connected, while Mitch McConnell continues to feel no sense of urgency to act when millions of hardworking Americans are in urgent need during this pandemic, House Democrats once again took action and Senate Democrats are ready to act right now. We're going to continue to fight for every family to have a fair wage and a fair shot to work hard and make it in our country. Too many Americans are running out of time right now, and it's way past time Mitch McConnell took action. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you, Senator Stabenow, and thank you to Leader Schumer. And just uh, on Leader Schumer's first point, you know, one of the very first actions the Trump administration Justice Department tried to take uh, was to pull back the consent order on the Baltimore City Police Department that had been put in place by President Obama in the aftermath of Freddie Gray's loss. And they actually took it to court. And a, 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 a judge ruled that they couldn't pull it back because it had been put in place just in time. But that was one of the very first things they tried to do. Look, I, I, we continue to hear every day uh, from uh, Americans uh, who have lost uh, loved ones uh, as a result of COVID-19. As of today, uh, more than 116,000 Americans have died, more than in any other country on earth. 20 million Americans are unemployed because of the economic fallout and harm. And it would be gross negligence for this Senate to go home for a two-week break over the 4th of July without the opportunity to vote on additional emergency relief. Um, Senator Schumer said in the Banking Committee here we, today, we heard from uh, Chairman Powell. Uh, he mentioned the importance of funding state and local government. He mentioned the importance 
of relief to renters. And we need to take that action now. We've already lost 1.5 million jobs at the state and local government level. Uh, many of those are frontline workers. And as Senator Schumer said, July 1st is the deadline for many local and state budgets, including in my state of Maryland. And they're going to have to lay off more and more Americans while the Senate is away for two weeks during the 4th of July break. That makes no sense. So we need to act now. Another cliff uh, is the cliff for the eviction, uh, uh, evictions. Right now, up to July 24th, there's required federal forbearance with respect to renters uh, and those on their mortgage payments. Uh, but that is going to hit very soon. And if we don't act, there is going to be a tsunami of people who are evicted from their homes. And we know COVID-19 has laid bare many of the racial disparities in this country, uh, including the health care impact. The same is true when it comes to security and housing. If you look at the renters around the country, uh, you'll find that uh, people of color are twice as likely to be renting as others uh, in the country. And if you look at a snapshot of the May census report, uh, they found that 44% of black tenants said they had little or no confidence that they would be able to meet their next payment. That was the snapshot in May. We're now in June, and we haven't taken action on that. Now, Senate Democrats have put forward a plan. Um, I want to salute uh, the ranking member on the Banking Committee, Sherrod Brown, and, and others. Uh, it's called the Emergency Rental Assistance and Rental Market Stabilization Act. It authorizes $100 billion for an emergency rental assistance program to help families and individuals pay their rent and their utility bills and stay in their homes uh, during this crisis. It also helps rental property owners of all sizes continue to cover their costs. Now, those provisions and more are in the HEROES Act passed by the House of Representatives. They provide that relief to state and local governments. They provide that emergency assistance for renters. So we need to act now. We see these cliffs are coming up. You know, the, the smart thing is not to walk off the cliff. The smart thing is to act now to make sure that we address uh, these very important issues. Uh, and that's what we, we call upon uh, our Republican Senate colleagues to do. Thank you, Chris. OK, questions? Um, and he put it on Democrats to allow the 60 votes for it to move forward. Is that something that Democrats are willing to do to Look, negotiate we the bill? On we the haven't floor? even seen the bill yet, so it's premature to comment. I will say this. We heard from President Trump that he was going to have a very strong executive order, and it's weak tea. It's a very, very weak bill. Um, it doesn't have the things that we need. Uh, on the things they said they might have, getting rid of um, chokeholds, it doesn't. It's more voluntary. Putting a national registry, it doesn't. It's more voluntary. So it's premature to comment. Let's wait and see what Tim Scott's bill is. I have no idea what's in it. Yes. Why not allow the debate to happen on the floor and then try to amend it on the floor rather than potentially blocking it on the front end? We haven't made any decisions. We're waiting to see Tim Scott's bill. Are you okay if Democrats come out and, and, and co-sponsor that bill? We're all waiting, I think, as a caucus to see what's in the bill. Yes. Uh, you work for Senator Van Hollen. Um, Larry Kudlow is one of the major economic advisors to, to uh, President Trump, and he has said that he doesn't believe there is systemic racism in American society. Now, he's going to be helping negotiate the next CARES package, presumably with you guys. And Senator Van Hollen's brought up that there's uh, racial inequities in housing. Absolutely. Is it a problem that someone with that belief is going to be involved on the other side? I think side it's a giving? problem that he has that belief, and it's a problem that too many people in the administration have that belief. But we Democrats, when we negotiate the COVID bill, are going to stand firm, and it has to, ha has to deal with the economic racial injustice that is endemic in America, whether it's health care or housing or feeding or anything else. Do you want to say something, Chris? No? I, I would only um, I would refer uh, Larry Cutler to the statements of the uh, head of the Atlanta Bank for the Federal Reserve, uh, Mr. Bostic, uh, who said very clearly uh, we have
of systemic racism uh, we, we have. It, you have to be blind not to see uh, it in many places. Yeah, that's, I agree with Chris. You've got to be blind not to see this. And if you say there isn't, you're not walking on the same earth that most people are. Yes? Are you worried at all about Amy McGrath um, losing her primary in Kentucky? Look, Amy McGrath is our candidate. She's a strong candidate. She's giving McConnell a run for his money. Uh, the Republican um, uh, Super PAC put $10 million into Kentucky. Uh, she's doing very well, and I believe that she'll win the primary, and I believe that she'll give McConnell a run for his money. Okay, yes. The uh, vice president in a Wall Street Journal op-ed just now declared that there isn't a coronavirus second wave and that panic over a second wave is overblown and fear-mongering. What's your reaction to uh, that? Dr. Pence would not be someone I'd go to for a medical checkup or for medical advice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.